specifically Colombia. Um, I think because we never talked about Chile before on the podcast, and it is just interesting to see this whole realignment, not to use the, <laughs> the, the term that we were just using, but it's amazing to see the resurrection of pink tide slash red tide taking over Latin America. Um, in con strict contradiction to the attempt at the reinstallment of the Monroe Doctrine and in direct defiance to the United States Empire and United States imperialism and pushing it farther than it has in recent past because when you're looking at a country like Colombia, they've never had a leftist leader. It has always been essentially an extension of U.S. power. It's always been essentially a neo-colony. I mean, you know, first it was, uh, of course, all the counterterrorism with fighting communism. You know, these paramilitary death squads that were trained by the U.S. that took the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. All of the violence that... Um, that politicians posit with this false equivocation between, you know, guerrilla fighters like FARC and the ELN, they try to compare it being like, oh, it's just like this, this never ending battle. And that's their reason why they have to just constantly go after like anyone deemed on the left, including union leaders, teachers, farmers, like literally campesinos are all at risk. It is one of the most dangerous countries in the world to just be any of these people. It's very fucking scary. And so, um, you know, for the last 70 years or so, the U.S. has had has poured billions of dollars into Colombia, um, training these death squads, and then it pivoted over to the war on drugs with Plan Colombia, another huge injection of cash. It's basically the Israel of Latin America. You know, just like the Uganda is the Israel of Africa for the U.S. empire, Colombia has been used as a staging ground to not only train all of these death squads and basically control the resources and the flow of drugs, I may add, um, with the recent right-wing parties that were controlling and using the drug war as the pretense to crack down on essentially anyone who's on the left. At the same time, these right-wing figures in government were trafficking drugs themselves, and they all had direct ties to the cocaine trafficking. But also, and I think most importantly, it's used as a staging ground to control surrounding countries, primarily its neighboring country of Venezuela. And so you saw a lot of the operations launched against Maduro, against Hugo Chavez. A lot of the training takes place in Colombia to launch these operations from the border and also to run drugs and, you know, run people through whenever they need to try to destabilize um, this region. Also, it has the most U.S. military bases of anywhere else in Latin America. So I think there's seven, yeah, seven military bases in Colombia. Um, so, I mean, just, just imagine how much control the U.S. has. And, and it is one of the most unequal countries, one of the most violent countries in the entire continent, I will add. It was very scary to go there. I went to Tumaco, a region where there was just a, a massacre of campesinos who were trying to transition from cocaine crops to other crops, and they were just mowed down by paramilitary forces in the middle of the jungle, all under the pretense of fighting these guerrilla forces it's just a never-ending struggle. And the problem is that the right-wing leadership who was in power for so fucking long, the lineage was um, these really corrupt politicians who were basically you know, under the thumb of the U.S., and they hated the fact that there was a peace deal with the FARC that they didn't have a reason anymore, even though they were still doing it, to just go and just unrepentingly unleash barbarism and fucking violence against anyone who could be construed as the enemy. And so basically, um, Alv Alvado Uribe and his handpicked successor, Ivan Duque, who was leading Colombia for a long, long time before this new guy won, were horrible, right? They hated the fact that there was a spark peace deal and they wanted to abolish it. And that is, and there was other fighting forces that had not arranged the peace deal. So ELN, when I was there in the remote jungle, there was still plenty of armed guerrilla fighters out there fucking hiding out. That was the one thing that they had on their side. That's why FARC was able to survive for so long, because they had the terrain, just like the Viet Cong in Vietnam. These people knew the fucking jungle, and they fucking hid out in that goddamn jungle. Um, and so it, it's just so crazy that 
uh, the, this country that's been just beholden to like fascist forces under the thumb of the and repressed by the U.S. for so long was able to elect a fucking former M-19 guerrilla fighter <laughs> with a hair of the vote, 50 point five percent of the vote this guy got i'm shocked that they didn't try to do a recall and like recount balance and basically try to get him out of office but it's incredible that this guy was a former guerrilla fighter previously jailed granted amnesty he also was leading an investigation of ties between paramilitary death squads and the government i met people there who had to have security detail and heavily fortified homes because they were fucking scared of getting assassinated that were doing similar stuff to this guy so the fact that Gustavo Pedro actually won this fucking election over some like fake right wing populist Trump type figure, Robbie, some like billionaire mogul guy who was just a fake ass dude who actually praised Hitler um, like cartoonishly. So he actually fucking won, dude. I mean, it's definitely not like a mandate. But like in terms of like a huge sweeping victory, but it's just insane symbolically. It's a huge thorn in the side of this U.S. hegemony. I'm not sure what he's going to do if, if he's going to try to make waves with the U.S., but just symbolically speaking, just like um, Obrador representing Elmo in Mexico is such a huge shakeup, you know, especially even even though he still denounces, con you know, undemocratic countries like Venezuela, Nicaragua and Cuba. The fact that it's still a thorn in the side of the neoliberal economic suppression and dictates of the region is huge. And whether it's the pink tide or the red tide, um, it, it's an incredible thing that's happening. And the fact that it happened in Chile as well back in December of 2021, that basically, you know, just threw off the chains of the Pinochet legacy um, and elected some 36 year old fucking student leader. And now they're doing this huge referendum to rewrite their constitution to include, you know, workers, indigenous rights, women's rights. Like, it's incredible. Neither of these people are openly anti-imperialist leftists as part of, like, the Alba Bol Bolivarian Alliance to resist U.S. colonialism, like Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela are, but, or Bolivia, but it's incredible, and it's important. And I think that um, Washington has no idea how to fucking handle this at all. And we saw it we saw what kind of effect that had when Biden tried to, you know, put together this hodgepodge summit of the Americas and no one fucking gave a shit and no one showed up. And they were like, dude, you don't control us anymore, bro. We're we're doing our own shit here. So I'm super stoked on it. I mean, who knows where it's going to go. But right now. I'm I'm just so thrilled that a country like Colombia has like kind of thrown off the shackles of control and is now trying to pave their own future. They're even talking about like stopping fossil fuels. Like at the outrage of the Economist and all, you know, the Atlantic, everyone's like oh, up in arms being like, oh, my God, they're going to destroy their economy. It's like, no, this guy actually gives a shit about climate change. So watch out, baby. Like shit's shaking up. And that or, or watch Empire Files. We did some really yeah. great reports from from Columbia. We did some reports on the School of the Americas that covers a lot of the dark history and legacy of what the CIA's role has been in shaping this region. And I guess that's that's the overall takeaway is like the fact that the CIA has fucked up this region so much, right? Millions of deaths and disappearances and and all of these fucking coups and like 53 military interventions. Interventions militarily. We're not including sanctions and whatever soft power shit, quote unquote. That That's like direct shit since like 1953. So, I mean, wrap your mind around that. And the fact that this is the outcome, it was a complete, fi I mean, yeah, it took, you know, millions of lives were taken and like the struggle continues. But the fact that these people persevere, nevertheless, they persisted like Elizabeth Warren. But I mean, it really, it, it's so inspiring, Robbie, because I think that we get mired down in the hopelessness and lack of optimism in this country because of how just the lack of capacity to do anything and like rent is just suffocating everyone. And I don't even see how, you know, this legislative coup that just happened with the Supreme Court, it's getting really dire and it's really easy to get totally sucked into hopelessness.
business because it a lot of times it does feel that way. But when you look at this region of the world, I really I get inspired and I really try to take some optimism from the fact that they were in a state of complete destitution, neocolonialism and fucking outright fascism. And like that led them to this point. You know, and it's it's beautiful. And um, I just hope that we can we can take a cue from them and try to organize ourselves accordingly.